Welcome everyone to Passport's Virtual Journeys. Uh, today we're heading out on safari in South Africa with the team at Sabi Sabi Bush Lodge. And we're joined today, um, especially by family safari guide, Ali Ross, who started her career as an educator in Johannesburg and is now guiding in Kruger National Park in the Sabi Sabi Reserve. I won't spend too much time talking because I'm sure my daughter doesn't even want to see me speak that long and wants to get straight to the fun and, and all of the animals. But um, just a couple of housekeeping things as we get started. Parents, please, you know, type any questions you have into the chat box um, and, and try to stay on mute and, and have your video turned off just because we have so many videos. Um, and on that note, we do have a lot of, um, a, a good portion of the presentation today has been pre-recorded so that we made sure that we had some great sightings for everyone. Um, and then there are also some live elements. So we'll be switching back and forth. Um, so please forgive any little small technological lags that we have. Um, We'll be, uh, Ali will be asking questions through, um, throughout the presentation. So please pop up your little emoji hand um, if you know the answer and we can kind of kind of go through there and, and, and pick out people. Um, and without, I guess, any further ado, Ali, well, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much. It's incredible to be able to share this experience with you guys, even if it is from afar, but we look forward to the journey that we're about to head out on. So I hope you folks enjoy. South Africa based within the Greater Kruger National Park and we look so forward to welcoming all our extraordinary journey families to safari today. We have so much in store from you from exceptional sightings on our reserve to a little bit of scatology, examining different groups from different animals as well as fantastic storytelling, local beliefs and traditional uses. We look forward to having you and cannot wait for all of your questions that are in store. Very warm welcome to all of you from across the globe. Today, we are in search of some gentle giants that we find here in the African bush. These animals can weigh anywhere between four to six tons. It's the African elephants. And if you can see just behind me, cracking in the branches, right over there, there they are. We found exactly what we're looking for. What an incredible find. Look at the size of this herd. So this herd is generally made up of mostly females and their calves, baby elephants. The only males that are in the herd are the young ones. Once males reach the age of around 10 to 15 years old, they get sent out to live alone or alongside other males. Females will grow up in the herd and remain here with their own calves one day. The family is then made up of sisters and aunties and mothers and grandmothers and their bonds are very similar to the ones that we have with our families. The family group is led by the eldest female and the most knowledgeable female of them all. We call her the matriarch. She is responsible for the safety and the movement of the herd. She will remember information from many, many years ago, even that passed down to her by her mother. When it comes to finding food and water, she knows exactly where to go. As you can see, elephants are herbivores, feeding only on plant matter like grasses, shrubs and fruit. And clearly their plant-based diet is incredibly healthy for them because they have a lifespan of up to 60 years. And then we have the elephant trunk. This attachment has to be one of the most fascinating body parts in the whole of the animal kingdom. Our human bodies are made up of around 639 muscles. The trunk alone in an elephant is made up of thousands of muscles, up to 40,000. They are incredibly powerful, but also gentle. They are an important part of the elephant's body because they do just about everything with their trunk. The elephant's trunk can lift up to around 770 pounds, that's 350 kilograms, as though it were a bag of peanuts. But it can also pick up a single leaf without crushing it as though it were using fingertips. In order for elephants to stay as big as they are, these gentle giants need to be eating a fair amount of food. 
They eat all day long and can eat anywhere between 200 to 300 kilograms of food. This is about 4 to 7 percent of their body weight on a daily basis. As you can imagine, what goes in must come out. And out it definitely comes. Elephants can drop up to about 150 kilograms of dung in a single day. How thick is an elephant's skin? So as you can imagine, they have incredibly thick skin. Their skin in some areas is around two and a half centimeters, and in some places it is a little bit thinner. But with thick skin like that, they can get really, really hot. So elephants have really unique ways in which they keep themselves cool. One is they will often mud bath. Throwing mud on the body acts as a cooling agent, just like sunblock, and also fights against parasites. Number two is they also have really large ears and they are designed in this way to pump blood around the body. The skin on the ear is a lot thinner than anywhere else on the body and there are many veins and capillaries that sit very close to the surface of the skin. So when they are flapping their ears they are actually cooling the blood that then circulates from the ears through the body, cooling down their bodies. Pretty clever. This incredible trunk that they have as well can also send smells from many different directions from several miles away. They are said to smell out fresh water from eight miles away. That is pretty incredible. For now, we don't think we could have asked for a better sighting of these incredible creatures. I think the most fascinating thing for me is how quiet the elephant is when they walk. These animals have a really special foot structure. They walk on their tippy toes. Underneath the toe bones, called metatarsals, they have a large fatty pad made up of cartilage, like our nose and our ears, which expands, flattens like a pancake when they walk, acting as a shock absorber for the weight of this large animal. Black with white stripes or white with black stripes. So you might know them as Marty from Madagascar, but here we call them zebras. And the way that we've been seeing them in a loose herd structure like this, we refer to them as a dazzle of zebra. That is the collective noun for when we see zebras together. So we've now spoken about the fact that they're called the dazzle of zebra when they're together. And the dazzle effect is a very unique way in which they protect themselves. So when zebras generally run away from predators, they run together. And all their stripes combined make it very confusing for a predator to pick out one individual. So every zebra you see here today has its own unique stripe pattern. This means that not one zebra has the same stripes as another. Their stripes are just like our fingerprints, all unique. So there are a number of reasons why zebras actually have these stripes. Not only is it to confuse predators with the dazzle effect or parasitic flies that sit on the body of the animal, but it also helps regulate or control the zebra's temperature, their body temperature. Hot, cool, airflow, it helps them keep cool. Thirdly, is when a foal is born they are able to actually locate and find their mother in and amongst the herd by their unique stripe pattern. So before a foal is reintroduced into the herd the mother will keep the, the foal quite close to her side and limit contact between them and the rest of the herd. 
This is so that the foal can learn to identify or find its mother by using its senses, sight, sound and smell, and then, as we spoke about, that unique stripe pattern. As we're seeing now, zebras tend to stay in these small family groups made up of dominant males, um, a number of females, and their young, their foals. But they are not all as peaceful as they seem. The males can be quite aggressive to one another, fighting one another with piercing bites and very powerful kicks to try and win the competition of the females. However, their fierce fighting skills and strong bonds with one another are what protect them from predators such as hyenas, lions and sometimes even leopards. They will team up together and even face the predator ready to fight back as a group. How incredible is this? We noticed some vultures flying around and thought we would do some inspection and a, a long way we came across a white rhino. How incredible. So you can notice that this rhino is incredibly sensitive to sound. Watch how his ears move one by one. He's trying to pick up all the sounds around him and figure out where exactly it's coming from. So have a look at this guys, we've just spotted some white-backed vultures out here and this may be a really great indication that the lions are somewhere close by. If you love Disney's Lion King, then you are going to sure love what we've just found now. We have got a couple of big male lions lying underneath the tree here. So as you can see, these guys are quite large. They're one of the largest cats that we get here at Sabi Sabi. To give you an idea, the average dad back home is around 197 pounds. That means that one lion is two dads. As you can see, we've just moved the vehicle around to the other side of the bush so we can get a better look at some of the other males. These males comprise of a group of four individuals. So, this means that these boys will stay together for a long period of time, surveying a territory, marking and protecting a certain area. But, for now, they're sleepy. As you can see, they're as full as full can be and their tummies are super big. They've just finished an 1,000 pound meal. You'll notice that the males have a really large mass that kind of meets in between the middle of the horns. We call this a boss. And when you are the boss, you generally tend to be a little bit bigger and stronger than the others. So a great way to have a look and see which male is more dominant than the others is to have a look at whose horns are a lot larger and a lot thicker. So as for the females, you can see that their horns are a lot smaller as well as the fact that they don't have that big mass that meets in the middle of their head. They have just a little bit of hair that grows in between the horns. And they're often accompanied by a calf. Calves are their little babies. So being the incredibly large animals that they are, they can easily overheat. And they would tend to spend more time feeding in the cooler hours of the day at night time. But with the weather we're having today, we're incredibly lucky to see them out and about and feeding in the open area. African buffalo can live in really large herds ranging anywhere from about 50 individuals to a thousand in some areas. These large herds are made up of females, their calves, juveniles and other large dominant males just as we're seeing now. So buffaloes, much like the cows that you may get at home, spend an awful lot of time sitting and chewing. They are chewing on what we refer to as the cud. So buffaloes have a really, really good digestive system and what they are trying to do is extract as many nutrients from the food that they eat as possible. We call this rumination and I know it's a big word 
but really what it means is that they just chew their food over and over and over again. So even though the buffalo's day is just full of eating, water is just as important to them and they need to drink at least twice a day. Because of the grass and the plant materials that they eat, they're incredibly rough, so water needs to be a big part of their diet. And in one session, a buffalo can drink up to 35 liters of water. That's equivalent of nine gallons. So your SUV at home takes 15 to 16 gallons of fuel in the tank, which means that in a full day, a buffalo can be drinking whatever is in your fuel tank at home. Can you imagine having that much water? You would pop like a balloon. So buffaloes as large as these can be anywhere from 300 to 900 kilograms, male and female depending. That's roughly about 700 to about 1800 pounds. Allie, I think you're still on mute. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, it was absolutely incredible to be out there in the bush and seeing all these animals, absolutely special. I was wondering if any of you were listening to what was happening or if you were just watching the animals. So I have a couple questions up my sleeve and if you do know them, feel free to pop your emoji hand up in the chat box and we will see if you are right. So the first one is the weight of an elephant. How much does an elephant weigh? I think everyone's being shy this morning, Allie. <laughs> oh, I see two raised hands coming up. If you know that um, answer to that question, you may hold on to that. I'll give you a second one to think of. And what do we call the female elephant that really much runs the herd? So two questions for you. How much does an elephant weigh? And what do we call the female who leads the herd in certain directions? I see a four ton there, very close. Yes, females weigh four tons, very nice. Nicole Rousseau, nicely done. Yeah, wide, wide range of guesses there. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else with a guess for the weight of an elephant? We have one ton, 5,000 pounds. So I guess that's two and a half tons. So everyone's covered their pieces food. there. <laughs> um, the name at which we call the female elephant. Yes, Melissa, four to six tons, spot on. Good job. <laughs> we have a winner. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and our female elephant is called, what do we have, Allie? Oh, I don't have anybody answering that one right now, but the female elephant, that <laughs> cow, <laughs> matriarch, yes, Nicole, very nice. Yes, the, the female elephant that leads the herd is called the matriarch, and she's responsible for making really good life decisions for her youngsters and, the, um, and her herd members, leading them to good food and water when they are moving through the bush. So matriarch is correct. Nicely done. We have a couple, um, of, a couple of answers yeah. for, for cow. Is, is, could cow be considered? Cow, cow is correct. Yeah, we call them a cow or a bull. Um, generally, this is size dependent where we are on the scale of cows to bulls and all animal species. But um, what we're looking for there is the female who leads the herd. There is only one matriarch per herd, and it generally tends to be the, the oldest and the most knowledgeable female. All right. There we go. We've got one right saying oldest and knowledgeable female. <laughs> Okay, doke. So with the safari side to the the end of them, we are going to move on to Indibele doll making. Um, and this is something that the kids who visit the Elephant Center that is based at Bush Lodge that they thoroughly enjoy is making traditional dolls that symbolize a lot of meaning. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, Enrica is the head of our Elephant Center at Bush Lodge and Michaela is actually one of the students that goes to the school there and lives on the reserve as well. Her father is our MD 
of our company and her mother is the Bush, um, Bush Lodge Lodge Manager, which is wonderful. So she has grown up on the reserve and had to experience all this wonder of safari every day on her back door. Hi, my name is Enrique and I'm the elephant coordinator at Sobi Sobi. And today we're gonna to show you how to make a new- Jamie, I see this. With me, I have Michaela and she's gonna introduce herself to you. Hello, I'm Michaela Windham and I live here at Sabi Sabi. I'm helping Rika make Ndebele dolls. Okay, so today we're going to show you how to make a Ndebele doll. And firstly, the Ndebeles are divided into two tribes. The northern Ndebele lives in the modern day Zimbabwe and the southern Ndebele lives on the high felt area of southern Africa. For, firstly, before we can make this Ndebele doll, we need a few things. I'm going to show you exactly what we need step by step. We need a plastic bottle. You can use any recycled plastic bottle. We need some sand to fill up the bottle. We need some piece of material, any color you'd like. And then any scraps of material to fill up the head. We will need some beads, any color you, that you would like. Small beads, preferably. We need some black acrylic paint. Some paint brushes and water and then we will need some glue to stick everything on and then lastly we will need some eyes you can have some googly eyes or normal buttons to make your eyes so for step one um, you have to paint your plastic bottle black and we already went out and paint our plastic bottle nice and black so you can take your time, paint it nicely, and then wait for it to, to dry. After your bottle is nicely dry, um, you can put some sand in your bottle. There you go, just so it's nice and weighted. The next step of the Ndebele doll is to make the head part. And you will need a nice big piece of material, any color that you would like. And then small pieces of scrap material that you can fill the head with. So fill your head nicely that, with all the pieces that you would like and give you a nice shape. And if you're happy with the shape, you can just tie it with a little string. Make it nice and tight so that everything stays in together. Okay, and then you can put it aside for later. Okay, so now for the tricky part and the part that takes a little bit longer is the beading part. So we kind of take a nice big string of any color that you would like with a needle and then you kind of beat small little beads into it and make like a nice big string with it. A very interesting fact about Ndebele women, their dress shows the status within the community and age. Beads and hoops like the one in front of Michaela are worn around their neck and legs and are gifts given to the women from their husbands on their wedding day. As you can see, I have finished beading my necklace for the doll that we were going to wrap around the neck of the doll. After the necklace, we're going to put the head on the doll and you need a little bit of help there if somebody needs to hold the doll for you. And then you can just put it nicely on top and then take your string and tie it nice around the bottle cap. See if we can make it as tight as possible. Maybe go around a little bit more than once just to tie it proper. We don't want a headless in the bell at all. Um, let me see scissors. Just cut off all the extra things. 
to make it nice and pretty before you put the necklace on. So now that we cut off all the extra fabric, we're going to add a blanket today. And the means of a blanket in the Nibella culture is it signifies the marriage and the status within the tribe. So we're going to add a little blanket here to show that it can be nice. Okay, you can just tie it nicely, put it in, and then Michaela is going to string the beads all around the neck. You can put a little bit of glue on the top. All around. Okay, put a little bit of glue on the ends of your necklace that you can just stick it nicely on the blanket. There you go and then afterwards we will put your eyes if you've chosen googly eyes you can put some glue on the back of your googly eyes and if you've chosen buttons you can put some glue on the back of the buttons and then just stick it onto the head There you go, and that's your Nibele doll. <laughs> and there you have it, we've made our own Nibele dolls, quick and easy. And thank you for joining us, we hope we see you soon here at the Elephant Centre. So one of the fun activities in the activity book that we'll be sending following up is all of the step-by-step -step instructions on how to make your own Nibele doll. So. This way, you know, you kind of have a visual on how it all comes together and the instructions will make sense. I'm sure that's a really great activity for any kids to be doing at home. If you have these few scrap items left behind, I highly encourage that you get your little ones to paint bottles and do creative things. Um, this is a question that I, I get quite often is how I kind of came in guiding and this may be of interest to some of you back home that may want to pursue this or even come down and just visit Africa and see what life is like over here and we sincerely hope that you do but my journey into becoming a, a guide started at a very young age. Um, much of it, we hope that these are the ages that are watching us, little people that are being inspired by the bush. Um, I was all of eight when I decided I wanted to become a guide. Obviously, growing up, I never went straight into it. I went into education first, and that's where my love for teaching and children. And I was able to really mold little minds and inspire people in um, that is very important. And my guiding journey started. I'd always loved the bush. I've always been involved in the bush. I've done many trips for many many years um and i finally got to the point when i was around 25 years old that i thought i'm just delaying the inevitable so i might as well jump in with both feet and pursue my dream and i started out 
Wildlife College, I had quit my job teaching, left the city and moved to the bush to live out in the middle of nowhere for a whole six months whilst I studied and got my qualifications as a guide. And from there on, I've just been building over the last three and a half years that I have been involved in the industry. And for me, it is so important that I, I can change people's lives through what I do. And I think that's something that is so special as the, as in the tourism industry, especially here in South Africa, in Africa, in the bush, where we get to really just give people once in a lifetime dream, something that some, some only are fortunate to see once or twice in their lifetime. So for me, giving people that dream, letting them leave, knowing that their souls have been fulfilled with what they've seen here in Africa, um, young kids who join us on safari and are blown away by what they're seeing, and they know that it's just so special to be seeing rhinos, to elephants, to lions and leopards and, and walk away inspired. That's all I've ever wanted um, in a job. And I feel like I've had exactly that. So a long journey as is, but one that is very accomplishable. And I have enjoyed every single moment of it. And I hope that by watching this, it inspires some of you to hop straight on a plane as soon as we can and visit and experience this world and this lifestyle that we have here. Hi everyone, I'm here by an uh, elephant where kids enjoy themselves when they're here for safari. Okay, now I'm going to tell you a story which is quite nice and nice to listen to. Okay, the story is all about water bug, how the mark on the back of water bug evolved. Okay, the mark on the water bug's back evolved long, long time ago. The story goes like God created the earth and then after creating the earth, he created humans as well as animals living together as one. And then God instructed the humans that you must build a toilet for me, which all of you can use. And then all the humans agreed and then they built the toilet and then they asked God, what do you want us to put there in the toilet? And he said, please, can you paint there on top with the white paint? And then they did that. And then he gave an instruction that no one must use the toilet until he said so. And then it continues like that. During the night, they said the water bug ate um, a tamboti tree, which caused uh, a stomach run inside its stomach. And then it wanted to use the toilet. And then it uses the toilet. They said it during the morning, God came. And then he wants to check the toilet. And he said, who used the toilet? And then everyone was like, I don't know. Who used the toilet? And he said, can everyone get it together? I want to check around you who used the toilet. And then God walked around and checked. And then he found a water bug. And he was like, water bug? What's wrong with you? Where do you get the white mark on the back? And then the water bug was like, I'm sorry. I used the toilet. And then God said to him, ah, oh, I found you now. You weren't honest with me. So now I'm going to cast all the generation that will come after you to help that white mark. And that's how the white mark evolved. So friends, you need to take instruction and listen to your parents. Thank you for watching this show. I hope all of you enjoy. I love you. It's a beautiful tale that has been told for many, many years, and Shane absolutely loves sharing it. Um, but up next, we have a little bit of Poo Patrol. I said in the beginning that we will be turning into little scatologists today. So here is all about examining the different dung that we get out on safari. Enjoy. So here we are out in the middle of the reserve, and it feels so great to be out here. One of the games that I like to play with families on safari is who flung dung? That's right. Whose poop belongs to who? And it's one of the most frequently asked questions because some of them can be a little bit confusing. And I think in the end, it is important to know which dung comes from which animals. It can tell you a lot about their behavior and essentially what you could be looking for in the long run. So today, we are literally going to dig into the dung piles that we find out here and hopefully we'll be able to pull up some differences between elephant and rhino and make them a little bit clearer for you to understand. 
So we've been fortunate to find some elephant dung. It's not entirely fresh, but we're still able to tell the differences between the two. And with such a large mammal, you can imagine that the dung that comes from this animal is also going to be incredibly large. So this is generally the size that we see that is dropped by elephants, and it can be a number of balls grouped together. And one of the biggest things is the color. So when it is fresh, it is nice and orange in color, orange to brown. But the biggest thing about the elephant's diet is the vegetation that it eats. So a mixture of leaves and twigs and grasses, and that is evident in its dung. So if we had to break it up inside here, you'll be able to see that we've got a little bit of leaf litter, as well as some really thick stems here that have come from tree branches and broken off. Here we can see that they've, they've chewed a little bit on these twigs and they're not completely digested. So this is always visible within the dung and it gives us a really good idea of, of their diet and what sort of food they take in during the day. Now, the difference between the elephant dung and the rhino comes down to their feeding. White rhinos are grazers and their heads and their mouths are perfectly adapted to do so. So you'll find that white rhinos will be feeding very close to the ground and on all the grass. We call these grazers. So if we have a look here, we've got some white rhino dung. Now the difference with white rhino comes in in their feeding styles. We spoke about elephants being you know, mixed feeders feeding on leaves and twigs and grasses as well, whereas white rhinos are purely grazers. Head hangs low, mouths nice and wide, feed like a lawnmower on the grasses that are available to them. And this can be seen in their dung. We're very lucky to find some fresh rhino dung here. You can still see it's very black in color, but also very wet inside. And if we had to break this open a little bit, you can see that it is purely just grass, nothing else in it. No twigs, no leaves, just grass. So this gives us a really good idea of their diet. And when we see them, they're feeding on just that. Um, but I think what the interesting thing at the end of the day is if we had to break the rhino species up, on the reserve we get black rhino as well. And the difference comes in is where the black rhino's diet changes ever so slightly. They are able to feed on twigs and leaves, and you'll be able to see that in their diet. And the very unique thing is, is that in their dung, you will find these perfect little twigs cut at a 45 degree angle um, in the dung itself. And that's how you would be able to tell the difference between white rhino dung and then black rhino dung. Here's a very important one. So everybody open up your ears. These are some of the incredible sounds that we get to listen to in the African bush. So if you can listen carefully, let us know what the answer is as soon as you've heard it. We have a couple of guessers here. I'm seeing, I'm seeing them coming through. <laughs> Unfortunately, Nicole, we don't get tigers here, but lion we do. So those of you that have picked lion are absolutely correct. Allie, can you tell the difference between a male lion roar and a female? You can to some certain extent. It takes a very well-trained, <laughs> well-trained, um, to do so males tend to be it's, it all comes down to the tone and the pitch but really when we hear when we hear it calling we just know that it's vocalization between pride members so there is a slight tone and pitch change between the males and the females and the speed in which they they vocalize like that but um definitely we just we just get excited when we hear the line vocalizing it's just really an incredible sound to hear um, it can be heard into the late evenings, early mornings, their contact calls, especially if they've been out and about and they have been hunting and they're trying to reconnect now. It's a way in which um, male lions will also 
uh, marked territory and audibly marked territory when they're out on patrol because they are patrolling such big areas. Um, they generally allow for not only the chemical scent trail that they leave behind in the means of, um, you know, a urine spray or dung, but they'll allow that vocalization to come out loud and proud, just like we're hearing now. And that can be heard from kilometers away and obviously resonates with other lions in the area that'll, that'll tell them straight that they do not belong here. They need to move out the area. Um, so besides from, you know, territorial patrol and general communication between the pride system, it's just such a beautiful sound to hear when we're out on safari. You can tell your little one, Nicole, that that was a fantastic guess. <laughs> Uh, do lions roar at each other? I'm just seeing that. Yes, they sometimes can. It comes in many varied vocalizations. Sometimes it can just be a, a contact call. It can be um, vocalizations that they do together as a group of males, as a pride entirely, with the females included. Um, but directly at each other, I don't think that it'd be as, as direct as we think. It's more of a communal and socializing kind of aspect of their vocalization. Great question. You are very welcome. There's been some phenomenal questions coming through here. <laughs> These little minds are working today. It's wonderful. It's definitely a goosebump <laughs> moment. Um, I see Brooke White, your question is what's wrong with um, his left paw? Uh, that was an injury that he established many, many years ago when he was younger. So he walks a little bit with a turnout, but he is perfectly healthy and it doesn't hinder his movement, his hunting or anything of the sort. Are there any more questions with regards to the lions? If not, we have Shane again, and he is back to tell us another exciting story about a very special bird that we get here in the Kruger National Park and surrounding areas called the Southern Ground Hornbill. I hope you enjoy. Okay. You can always well, count on little ones to have such keen you. eyes. <laughs> I would love to tell you a story about one of the amazing birds we have here in Sabi Sabi. We have a bird called the Southern Ground Hornbill, which is known as a rain bed in some other tradition. Morning the reason progress. behind was because long, long time ago, there was no television, there was no this technology that we have now. So it's one of the beds that we use in order to tell when it's going to rain. So the birds <laughs> come <laughs> in the <laughs> So many people from the tradition, such as the Zulu tradition, that's where the people um, started to take a, a feather out of their bird's nest and then they use it in order to summon the rain. So they will take that feather and then they bring it into a, a small dam or just into the river and they put it there. They said as much as they put it there for that duration of time, it can be two hours, can be three hours, can be a full day. The rain, it will come after two or three days and then start raining. So this bird, it was endangered by other tradition just because they wanted to summon the rain. So, okay, everyone, that was it for me to teach you all about the traditional belief and a traditional story about the Southern Ground Hornbill. Okay, and now we're going to open up the floor for just general questions. I think maybe Melissa, we have a great one still about about the lions, and maybe we can tackle that. It's definitely a different sound than what we're kind of used to with you know hearing lions in movies. So, I think that's actually a really interesting one. 
Allie, you're still muted. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, I think if you haven't heard it before, or you're hearing it for the first time, it does take a little bit of getting used to. It's a very deep guttural um, call that they create. And it's all about how air is pushed up from the lungs over the larynx and that expansion of the larynx uh, widening and closing is what creates these different levels of vocalization that we're hearing. Very, very guttural call. So if it's something that you're hearing for the first time, it can be a little bit strange. Ali, what are some 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 of your favorite sightings that you've had with guests out on game drives? What are some of those really exciting moments that you've been able to share with, <laughs> with guests? I mean, there I, I think there's so many after three and a half years of guiding, but wow, I, I think every day is just unique and different. And I think that's what is so incredible about Safari is that no matter how many great things you see on day one, you know, by day three, something incredible is going to happen. But some of my highlights have been finding leopard cubs of, of my own. So my tracker and out, um, I left early, early one morning and being able to come around the corner and you know be following this female leopard. I mean, leopard cubs is not something that you often see. Being a solitary animal, they tend to, they tend to keep their cubs very well hidden in places that are, are not privy to us being able to see them continuously. So as we rounded the bend with this female leopard on the move, she started chuffing. So that's the way that they call their cubs. It's like a very um, little air that's being pushed out and oof, oof, from her mouth. And it was just phenomenal. Once we heard that sound, we knew we were around the corner. We had seen all the signs of her being a lactating female and having cubs. When we came around the corner, she had on the all covered in barisa, very dense vegetation in a, in a riverbed and out popped this tiny little cub. It was all of that big. I almost lost my mind. It was absolutely incredible. <laughs> Babies are always one of the highlights of, of being on safari. Is there a, a, a good time of year to, to where you can see lots of them or does it just vary? Um. You know, it, it depends what species you're looking for. You'll find that your antelope species generally tend to lamb towards the end of the year so that they have good vegetation to take them through that lactation period. So, you know, being able to produce. So, for example, in Parliament, we will see a mate around May, April, May, and then it'll take them through to the end of the year, about a six month gestation, leading them straight into the rainy season. So, by the time they're giving birth, um, you know, good rains have fallen, the grass and the vegetation is really picked up and beautiful and green, which means that there's healthy eating for these females to then continuously produce milk for their young. With leopards, they're not set to a season, but you do notice a pattern. We work very closely with Panthera, who studies cats worldwide, and we do notice a pattern of females um, who are, you know, who tend to be good mothers and have had multiple litters. Um, reproducing later in the year. They know that once their cub starts to eat um, meat at around three and a half, four months, and they're moving on to a meat-based diet, um, if their cub is around that age towards the lambing season, that they've really nailed that timing incredibly right. So about three months prior to that, we'll see leopards sometimes having cubs, but cats aren't really privy to seasonal, um, seasonal births. Okay. Um, Kathy here has asked, do different animals ever come together for a common goal or purpose? Uh, that's a very good question, Kathy, and I, you'll see it all the time. Um, definitely, you know, when you, you're out there, the more eyes, the better. So one of the biggest reasons we see is for safety. Um, and it'll be with impalas and zebras and wildebeest. So a lot of plains game animal will come together and there will, there will almost be like a, a way in which they're all looking out for one another. We often see it with baboons and impala as well. Baboons will be on the higher levels of treetops, um, having that visual that stretches quite far and wide into the areas that impalas cannot see. And once their alarm goes off, the impalas know that something is in the area and they're able to then alarm and adjust accordingly and also get away and escape. So you will see no matter what habitat type and no matter where we are on the reserve and what sort of animals we're viewing, there are a lot of symbiotic relationships that actually benefit the other one as well. Do you have a favorite animal, Allie? I know that's a question that guides get, get asked often. What are, what are sort of, what is your favorite if you have one and why? I do, I have two. 
I have two and for completely different reasons. Um, number one is my leopard. Um, I do love a leopard <laughs> and I'm very much obsessed with leopards. I think that their whole aura and, and what they are as a, as a living being is just absolutely incredible. That ability to be solitary yet so powerful um, all embodied into one cat just it never ceases to amaze me and I'm always just I lose my breath every time I see one and I've seen so many in my lifetime being at Sabi Sabi which is absolutely incredible but their, their tenacity their, their power um, their intelligence is really something to be admired so leopards for me is definitely high up on my list the fact that you also have to work very hard to get one because they are quite an elusive cat really just makes you want to see one that much more <laughs> and my second one would be elephant i love how emotionally intelligent elephants are and i don't think you know we have fully grasped what they are capable of as a species um, and how much they can actually teach us as a human race at the end of the day they are probably one of the most interconnected social animals that I've ever witnessed and it is they are just incredibly special if you ever have time and if you ever are lucky enough to go on safari and you sit bang in the middle of a herd of elephants and you you just breathe breathe in that passion for livelihood that they have the way that they move the way that they feed the way that they communicate between one another is just absolutely incredible and it's it's enough it sends goosebumps down my spine right now as I'm speaking because they're just such special animals so they really humble a person's heart <laughs> oh. oh for for families who are are looking to take their um take their kids on safari for the first time are there things that you would recommend doing in advance to kind of prepare kids to you know have these experiences you know i i was watching you earlier sit on the edge of your safari vehicle and being so close to lions yeah. are there things that that families and kids should understand about safety or just things to help them get excited 100 percent. that's a very big thing safety is always number one priority when we are out there um the animals are very accustomed to the sound and the shape of the vehicle but they are very wary of what is inside the vehicle these are very intelligent beings that we are around um and i would just you know children just we don't want to take the joy of excitement away from them that's for sure so we don't ever require our children to sit down and sit quiet and you know, we want them to you know, have that little squeal when they see something for the first time and enjoy the moment. Um, but obviously, you know, when we're out there, we, we do our safari briefings in such a way that it is accommodating the entire family, not to be standing up in the vehicle. We don't want any injuries. We off-road quite often, very, very bumpy. Um, keeping arms and legs inside the vehicle is always a very good idea, especially when you are that close to lines. Um, but allow allow your children to share with seeing that animal for the first time i've had plenty of children in my vehicle that when they see them there's just this giggly excitement and this it just bubbles straight out of them and i think there's no, there is nothing more precious than that right there is children being excited about seeing these animals for the first time it's absolutely incredible so aside from the safety rules and regulations that come with being on an open vehicle inspire these children to just see the world with their little eyes and be very excited about it because what we have here is incredibly special. Absolutely. Does anyone else have have any other questions or we kind of ready to watch that game drive again? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I will um, turn my video on quickly and yeah, just sort of wrap it up here. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I know summer mornings, Saturdays are, you know, always tricky. I know there's a good chunk of people who are excited to watch the recording um, as soon as we can send it out. But um, thank you for being here live and for participating. I hope you got a little glimpse of what sort of life on safari is like and what a safari specifically at Sabi Sabi Bush Lodge could be like. Um, and having a really truly fabulous family safari guide like Ali kind of introducing your, your children to the greater world of safari and nature. So thank you for joining us, Ali. It was such a pleasure. Um, and we look forward to, to sending some, some clients your way. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions and the time spent with you guys. I mean, if there's anything more, you've got tons of people to ask, feel free to contact us. I mean, we look forward to everybody that is one day hoping to travel and wanting to come on safari. We're definitely waiting for you. Our doors are open and we cannot wait to share this experience with you guys. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.